today's video does contain content that some people may be sensitive to, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. And if you have a true scary story, or just a scary story you'd like to send my way, go to asthravendreams.com and click the button to do so. Now, that is out of the way. Today's video is the final of my June spotlight collection, I guess? I don't know. Uh, basically, the video is where I've been having guest spots. I started with Nightmare's Edge, then had PA Nightmares, 242 Reads, and then had TDN, and then last week was Swamp Dweller, which was awesome. I mean, they were all awesome. It's just cool to have Swamp Dweller on, too. Uh, this week, we have two lovely ladies, or as they call themselves so frequently, the BBs. And that's right, I said it in a very weird way because I'm not them. Anyways, uh, today we have Lady Spookaria and Miss Creepy Tales. Both are fantastic female narrators. Both do this very well and both have poured their hearts into it. So please do go show them some love if you enjoy what you hear. Constructive criticism is always welcome. As long as it's framed constructively, don't just be rude. That is never allowed on my channel, so... All that said, friends, here we go, so please, enjoy. So, this was three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, and it's now one of my favorite stories to tell now that I'm no longer scared. I've moved thousands of miles away, and a few years' time has passed. So my husband was in the military during this time, and I was a housewife due to work being hard for me to get in my area that I was in, as I can't drive and lived off base. Well, any military person knows that military schedule is pretty darn predictable, and much of our lives ran on an easy-to-memorize schedule, and to make matters worse, my husband was often gone for long hours. For two-ish to three-ish months, I'd been seeing this guy wandering around my home, peeking in the windows. Honestly, I didn't originally think much of it, beyond being weirded out. We didn't have anything that would interest a robber, no TV, a single seven-year-old computer, a broken couch and table, a mattress on the floor... Literally nothing expensive in our home beyond a gun that was locked up in a safe that may have looked like it had stuff. But that is a lot of work for what looks like a home of people living in poverty. So, I didn't think anything of it. Yet, he kept coming back when my husband was gone. I'd see him every few days or hear him do to my normally super sweet cat at the time hating him, and hissing and yowling when he saw him, so I would know he was there when my cat was making an angry fuss. Well, one day I went out with my husband, and I guess I didn't lock the door or something properly, as our lock could be a bit funny, and I was running late. According to our normal schedule, I'd have gone to base with my husband for family mandatory fun, and I'd have come back home alone in an Uber while my husband stayed on base to work or hang out with his friends. What ended up happening was that I fell sick with a migraine. I have hemiplegic migraines, so it can be serious, and his sergeants told him to take me home and take care of me when he saw me. Now, before I go on, I should probably describe my old home. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment complex in the mountains. It was a massive complex. My home layout was this. My front door led to my kitchen and dining area. My kitchen and dining area wall next to my door was another glass door. Think, like, patio door. Across from my kitchen was my room. Then, you go down the hall and hit the living room that has another glass door wall next to the fireplace. And, finally... After that, you go across the living room at the end of the hall, and you hit the guest room, or my plant room slash cat's playroom slash guest room, with yet another glass door wall. I was literally surrounded by giant glass doors. Then, outside we had a porch, and on the porch was a storage closet where I usually kept my bike, 
as I couldn't drive due to my migraines and seizures. Back to the story now that I've set the scene. So, when my husband brought me home again, not per our normal schedule, we came home to find our door slightly ajar. We gave each other a look and went inside anyways, with me mumbling how I must not have locked it properly, due to us being in a rush that morning. We walked into the kitchen where my husband immediately went to the fridge and started looking around for water for himself and me. He then spoke for the first time while in the fridge. Honestly, I don't even remember what he said. But then we heard something maybe a few seconds after he spoke. Our porch glass door in the back of our home moved. We both knew the sound really well, as I liked to sit on the porch reading for hours, so I was always coming in and out. He then grabbed my shoulder and whispered to grab his gun from our room, and he then grabbed a butcher's knife and went towards the living room. I went and grabbed the gun, noticing on my way to our room that down the hall, our living room glass porch door was wide open. Upon giving my husband the gun and following behind him as I dialed 911 in my panic, saying that I had an active break-in while my husband did a sweep of our home, and while I was on the phone upon coming back down the hall towards the kitchen to see if he went around back up and to the front, the only way out of the area that he went. As we lived on a literal mountainside, and one side was blocked off out back, we heard our storage door out back that we forgot to shut slam open. Me and my husband run back out there where we found our storage door swinging open and just barely saw the same guy who'd been spying on me and our home. He didn't end up coming back that day. I also later found that the only things missing were some of my clothes, lingerie, and bathroom care products. The police showed up about four hours later and took a statement from me and my husband. Eventually, my husband had to return to his normal schedule. I was terrified and he didn't like it, but we also had no choice till we could find a new place in three months when our contract ended. The first week things were fine. He didn't come back. My cat didn't yowl or throw any fits, so he didn't see him either. Things were fine that week. Then another week went by, and I started to think that maybe the gun we brought out had scared him. <laughs> yeah. No. The third week, he ended up coming back while my husband was at work in the morning. He first tried the door, and was trying to force it open. Then, he started banging on the glass next to the door. I put 911 on speaker and texted my husband while I panicked and cried. While I was on the 911 call, he ended up leaving the front door, giving up, and when I voiced that he walked away from the door to the 911 dispatcher, the lady spoke to me like I was being ridiculous, freaking out this badly over someone trying to get into my locked door. I hung up, and then finally called my husband while I had a full-on panic attack, and it turns out he was already coming home with a car full of his and my friends that were also in the army, and whom work with him, as they turned around towards me as soon as I texted what was going on. He ended up going to the back door and trying both glass doors there as well, before finally giving up. About four minutes later, my husband and his friends arrived and found me clutching my cat and crying. They ended up scanning the area and still did not find him. The cops showed up seven hours later, and I was very angry this time, but gave another report. I ended up with three of the guys sleeping over in the spare room, and my husband and me slept in our now locked and bolted bedroom. I got a lock installed on the bedroom door after the first time. Then, the next day, me and my husband's friends went out and got and installed cameras in all of our doors and window areas. After this last time, beyond him going back to looking in our windows three more times, I never had another issue. 
we moved out shortly after this, and since then, I never saw him again. Back in 2014, I went on a camping trip with my girlfriend at that time, Brooklyn. We had this planned out for a few months, saving up all we could as we didn't make a lot of money. We actually worked at the same place at that time. I helped her get a job where I worked because it made more than what she had at her previous job, and we could carpool, saving some money on gas. However, getting the time off you want was hard to do due to how scheduling worked, so when we managed to find a few days off together, we took advantage of it. We were long overdue for some time off together anyways. Unfortunately, it wouldn't go as planned. We wouldn't get to use this time to distress, unwind, and enjoy our time together. Something came up within her family, putting her in a bad mindset, as well as some changes at work, changing things for both of us in terms of how we were going to get paid. This caused more stress on us, especially her, so we were already on edge when it came time for our trip. We both loved camping, but we were far from professionals, I suppose you could say. We had a decent tent that fit both of us comfortably, and we had a cooler where we put some quick and easy food and drinks in, but we usually ended up going somewhere to eat at least once. Then, we also brought fishing poles and other little camping essentials to make the trip fun and memorable. The day before we left, some more stuff happened with her family, and I asked if we needed to cancel our plans. Where we were going, we had to pay for our campground reservation, and there were no refunds if you canceled. As mentioned, we loved camping but preferred campgrounds, so we at least had things there in case we forgot something. And of course, having physical restrooms were great too. So, it would have been disappointing having to cancel and lose that money, but I would rather her be comfortable and happy due to the circumstances. Anyways, she declined and said that she still wanted to go especially given the reservation plan, so we still went as planned. We got to the campgrounds, which was about an eight-hour drive, and then set up our tent. The night seemed to go really well. There was a family of five in the lot next to us that came over and said hi, and offered us food, but we declined as Brooke wanted to go to a place that we drove by on the way there. After we returned, we set up our chairs and went fishing for a while. She seemed very happy at that time, talking, joking, and taking pictures of our catches. The next day was even fun. We went to a nearby hiking trail, and she found all kinds of things to take back with us that she liked to collect, like rocks, deformed flowers or leaves, things like that. At one point... We even stopped to use the restroom, when a guy came up and was pretty much flirting with me. I'm a girl as well, so it was always funny when one of us would walk up to the other and hug or something and watched as the other flirter would scurry away embarrassed. So, it wasn't until later that night that we would run into problems. Even though rain wasn't expected all weekend, Clouds quickly formed and darkened the sky. She was worried that we were going to get rained out, and we didn't have a tarp or anything for the top of the tent, so she was talking about packing it up. I was trying to be optimistic and telling her that it was just cloudy and it wouldn't rain, but sure enough, it did. It wasn't a storm, and it wasn't long, but... We just sat in the car waiting for it to stop. We didn't have enough time to take down the tent either, so she was understandably upset about losing several hours of being able to do anything, 
but also that our tent was going to be soaked and probably impossible to sleep in. When it finally stopped, we went to assess the damage and to our surprise, the outside was definitely wet, but the inside was just a little damp. We actually bought a few beach towels, so I started wiping up the tent and set our sleeping bags out on the back of my truck to dry some. It only seemed to get worse as the night progressed, though. She seemed to get mad about other random things, typically small things like not being able to get the fire started and things like that. I knew she was going through a lot, so I didn't get mad at her. I just tried to do what I could to make her happy. However, when it was about time for us to go to sleep, or at least go to our tent and quiet down, she was not having it. She complained it was too hot and that the tent was still wet and was just mad at everything that I tried to do or say. Finally, she said what I was expecting all day, which was that she wanted to leave. However, it's now 9 or 10 at night and it's dark. Too dark to scramble around to pick everything up, take down the tent and then drive home because we definitely couldn't afford a hotel. I told her that we could leave tomorrow, only losing a day of our paid lot, but there was no way that we were going to be able to do it all tonight safely. She didn't like my suggestion. So she told me that I could sleep in the tent, and she went to sleep in the truck. I knew her well enough, that it wasn't worth fighting her. So I watched as she took the keys, and went into the darkness towards the truck. I laid there in the tent annoyed as well, and read for a bit before falling asleep. I was hopeful that she might come back in, so I wanted to be awake if she did, but she never showed up while I was awake. However, at some point in the night, she must have changed her mind. I was facing towards the tent wall, laying perpendicular to the entrance. So, when I heard her stepping around and slowly unzipping the tent, I pretended to be asleep so she didn't feel obligated to say something and to hopefully avoid any further arguments. She then quietly crawled into the tent and laid down. I assumed she was facing away from me, as she did when she was mad at me, because she didn't hug me or hold me like she usually did, which was fine because at least I knew she was in there with me. And after a few minutes of her shifting a bit and not saying anything, I just fell asleep none the wiser. The next morning, I woke up to an empty tent. I just figured that she wanted to get up and start prepping to leave, or maybe she was going to make breakfast for us, or some other morning ritual we did. But when I got out, she was nowhere to be found. I was a bit curious, so my first thought was to check the truck. And sure enough, she was in there and still asleep. I tried the doors, but of course, they were still locked, so I knocked on the window, waking her up. She seemed to be in a decent mood, though, telling me good morning and poking fun, asking if I got wet at all. After the jokes and her opening the door, I asked her when she went back to the truck, and she looked confused. She asked me what I meant by that, so I repeated my question mentioning how I knew she went to the tent because I had woken up to it. But she seemed confused and alarmed as she told me, I never went in the tent last night. That's when I started looking confused. She had to have gone to the tent as I heard it being unzipped and I could feel another person entering it. The color seemed to drain from her face as she repeated and was adamant that it wasn't her. In fact, she said she thought that I was trying to get in the truck because she heard someone pulling on the handle, and I confirmed that it wasn't me either. She said that she locked the doors and when she heard it, she yelled to go away thinking it was me. 
but when she heard what sounded like someone taking off running, she looked around but didn't see anything or anyone. So we talked a little more on the timeline of things, and it seemed like it was probably within an hour or so of us going to bed that the events occurred. We looked around the truck and the lot to see if we saw anything, and to our surprise, we found some shoe prints around the back of the truck that were not from us and several food wrappers from the lunch meat and chips that we had brought. We even asked the family that was by us if they were around our stuff or if they saw anything, and they said that they were all asleep. Needless to say, we were both pretty well terrified and no longer felt safe staying there. Who tried getting into my truck, and who slept in the same tent as me? I was thankful that Brooke locked the doors, so they couldn't get in. But this person was also brazen enough to open my tent after seeing someone in there, and then continue to enter it. What if I had woken up and saw them? Would they have tried to do something to me? Those thoughts terrified me. We packed up all of our stuff, told that family why we were leaving, and to be careful when they went to bed. The mom seemed pretty worried about it, and rightfully so as they had three kids with them. And I still hope that nothing happened to them. After we left, we decided to go to a nearby museum and a cute little local diner before heading home. Our relationship didn't survive, but we are all still friends and still work together, so this was often brought up when we talked about trips and creepy things that happened to us. However, we still don't have any answers. The thoughts of those what-if situations are always terrifying, but for the most part, it's become a weird who got a free meal and free one-night stay on us. Starting off, uh, this happened nearly 10 years ago, but I recently spoke with an old co-worker that I ran into again, and talking about the old days, it was brought up. And... That was when I realized the feeling of being stalked was not limited to just me. When I was about 22, and working for a small, small security company of only 18 people at the time, we worked in a tourism area location called Seven Falls, in southwest Colorado Springs, in the Cheyenne Mountain Canyon area. I remember the shifts being grueling, due mostly to the fact that we were mostly in direct sunlight during the afternoon and evening, and an average shift we were expected to walk a minimum of seven miles between the base of the parking area to the top of the falls, and rarely were allowed to use the guest elevator for handicapped and the elderly. The whole park was on a hilly incline, so... Walking the top down was okay. Bottom up is what exhausted us. In the evening, near the base of the falls, native Ute and or Cheyenne tribal dancers would perform and we had to monitor the crowds, which were slight breaks for about 15 to 20 minutes. These falls were frequented by area tribes for hundreds of years and was still considered spiritual. So... It was the native tribes that pushed for their performances, since Seven Falls is considered a state park. At the end of the night, we would sit at the main entrance into the falls at the bottom of the canyon, off Lower Gold Camp Road, and we would monitor the toll booth until roughly 1 a.m., except during the weekends and holidays, and then we were out there until 3 in the morning. On several occasions... When waiting for the end of my shifts, I always had occurrences that made me feel like I was going to get attacked by either an animal or a person. Guttural hissing 
deep, mannish groans and harassing growls could always be heard from behind the giant gate. Glowing eyes, either red or white in color, but larger than area wildlife, could be seen from behind brush and tree canopies. But what stuck with me is the shimmering humanoid shape. The shimmering was otherworldly. The way I always described it to my family, and a few friends, was that it was like the Predator. My first work firearm was an older Smith & Wesson semi-automatic single-stack pistol that was my dad's, from when he worked for the Mountain Police Department, but this was the first time that I felt I was defenseless while working. I watched the shimmering silhouette crawl on the asphalt, over to the toll booth, to then appear to be standing upright and extend a long, waving arm. This looked like a being phasing between the physical and incorporeal realms. As I shifted my weight to look closer as I was awestruck, the glowing reddish eyes slowly came back into focus. Then, in a snap, I hear what sounds like an animal climbing up the side of the tollbooth gutter, and watched as the shimmer jumped to a tree no less than 20 feet away. From here, the shimmering thing jumped again, this time a broken branch fell from the tree. A loud clashing sound rang from the top center in the gate, as the shimmer looked back one last time, before going over the gate and disappearing into the Seven Falls Park. And this brings us to today, in May of 2022, my old coworker and I ran into each other while at Walmart. We decided to go to the Gunther Toddy's diner next door. While having a burger and reminiscing about the good old days, he brings up, Did you ever see the Predator and his active camouflage at Seven Falls? My blood ran cold, and I dropped a shade to just about pale. He then proceeded to tell me about his experiences on his shifts that I've never heard. After leaving the diner and arriving home, I sat in my driveway for a moment, just contemplating what it is that inhabits Lower Gold Camp Road. My story takes place back in 2010, when I had just turned 19. I had finally gotten my own place away from my parents. Don't get me wrong, my parents were great and supportive of me staying with them while I went to college, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to go back to school. Staying with them meant being pressured into going back frequently, that and the fact that my dad is a youth pastor, so he was always rather strict and nosy when it came to my personal life. So. I was kind of counting the days until I was able to get out of there. I actually landed a decent call center job with a friend of mine. That made pretty good money, and he was looking for a roommate. So he and I went in on a two bedroom apartment on a small property in my town. It was a decent area, across the street from an elementary school, and walking distance from a strip mall that had a Target and a movie theater. My point is that it was pretty decent, and family oriented area that you wouldn't expect anything to happen in. When we got our lease papers signed and our deposits paid, the community manager wanted to take the time to walk around the property with us, to show us the amenities, and also wanted to introduce us to our neighbors. They said something about them valuing community, so introducing us to the people in our building was important to them. Most of the neighbors were decent people, a couple of older couples, a single mother with two kids, then, Across the hallway was an older gentleman that we're going to call Dan. Dan was a bit of a weird guy when we were introduced. He was awkward when he answered and the property manager told him who we were. But I kind of just thought that was who he was. Hell, I'm an awkward person myself so I was able to sympathize with him. After all that was said and done we started moving our stuff into our unit and sorting out our rooms, setting up the living room and all that. Then. About an hour or two into the whole thing, there was a knock on the door. I opened it up and it was Dan. He immediately asked if he could come in. At first, 
I was a bit nervous about letting him in. I didn't really know him, but after a moment, I figured, why not get to know him better? He walked in, and immediately started apologizing for his behavior earlier. I told him it was fine, and that it was awkward how they force people to meet their neighbors anyway, so I would have been the same way. He then mentioned he was actually a bipolar schizophrenic, and while he usually had it under control, he'd been having a lot of issues lately because of problems with his medication. And he wanted to come over to let me know that he wasn't normally that kind of person. Now, my brother was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder, so I had some understanding how hard it could be. I told him about it, and he seemed almost relieved that I seemed to understand what he was going through. After a few moments of idle talking, he said he had to get back and headed across the hall. Now, I have no issue with people that have mental disorders like he did. I was in a position where I could understand that it was hard, and I'd seen my brother go through a lot of hard times as I was growing up. I kind of expected that having him across the hallway would not be a typical neighbor experience, and that was fine with me. I, however, did not expect how things would go. About a month into us living there, I came home from work and saw Dan standing outside his apartment, just staring at his door. It was a bit weird, but I figured it was probably just an episode, and I thought maybe I could pull him back if I approached him carefully and spoke with him. I said his name once or twice, and he kind of reacted, but just kept staring. I asked him if he was okay, and he kind of turned towards me saying really softly, He locked me out. He told me I had to stay here until he lets me in. Thankfully, because of my brother's issues, I had some knowledge on how to approach someone in this situation. Stay calm and quiet. Don't touch the person. Ask them to sit down. And remember that you can't always reason with them. With all that in mind, I calmly asked him if he was feeling okay, or if he was feeling scared or angry. With all that in mind, I calmly asked him if he was feeling okay, or if he was feeling scared or angry, just trying to get a feel for what he was going through. He told me that he was mad, but he understood why he did it. He mentioned that he'd had a bad day and did something wrong, so he had to stay outside until he learned his lesson. I nodded slightly and told him it would be okay, and asked him if he'd like to have a seat while he waited. At first, he kind of looked a bit confused, but I told him I could bring out a chair so he didn't have to stand, because I knew standing there could get uncomfortable. That kind of got through to him, and said he would like to have a chair. I went into the apartment and got him one, and then asked him if he wanted me to stay with him, until he was allowed back in. He smiled at me, which I felt was a good sign, but then said that I wasn't in trouble like he was, so I should go back inside. I told him that I would if that's what he wanted, and mentioned that if he needed someone to sit out there with him, he could knock on the door and I would be there for him. It seemed to help some, but again, I knew he was in a bit of a different world in his head, so I wasn't going to pressure him. After going inside, I texted my roommate and mentioned that Dan was having an episode, and that if he was still out there when he got home, to approach him slowly and not make too much small talk. After he got home, he told me that Dan was still sitting there and staring at his door, and asked how long he'd been there. I only knew that he'd been there for around 20 minutes or so, but it was likely more. We left it at that for about an hour, but then around midnight, there was a knock on the door. It was Dan. He asked me if I could come outside and talk to him for a moment. I agreed and stepped out. I asked if he was okay, and he started crying as soon as I asked. I wasn't sure if he was still in an episode, or if he had come out of it, so I slowly reached my hand out and asked if he was okay, or if he needed me to call someone for help. I did not expect what he said next. He told me I needed to call the cops because he had hurt his girlfriend. The whole time he's saying this, he's sobbing and staring at the floor. I realized he was, at this point, more lucid than he was earlier, and I asked him what happened. He told me they got into an argument about something, and that he didn't remember what he did, but he knew she was in there and that she was hurt. I asked him if that was why he felt he needed to go sit in the hallway, and he nodded. He then asked me if I would go into the apartment with him to check on her, because he was scared to go alone. I said I would in just a moment, then went in and got my roommate to stand in the doorway just in case he wasn't all there yet. I told him that Dan needed me to go with him to check on his girlfriend, and that I told him to stand there just in case anything happened. We went into the apartment and it was a mess. There were dishes broken all over the floor, the living room was trashed, and it was pretty obvious that there had been a struggle and it was violent. I asked Dan if he knew where she was, and he said she was in the bathroom the last he saw her. I asked him if he would sit in the chair while I went to check, because I wanted him to stay calm. He agreed and went to sit down while I walked down the hallway to the bathroom. What I saw was as bad as I expected. This young woman was lying naked on the floor of the bathroom. 
There was blood all over the floor and the shower, and the room was completely destroyed. My initial thought was that he had killed her, but as soon as I walked into the room, I started hearing her groan slightly. To my surprise, she was alive, but barely. I called my roommate and told him to call 911, and to tell them there was a badly injured woman in the unit, then knelt down to try to talk to her. I asked her if she could hear me, and she whispered yes and asked for help. I didn't know what all had happened, and told her not to move just in case she had a head or neck injury, and I told her help was on the way. I asked her if she knew what happened, and she mumbled incoherently, but kind of just faded in and out. I told her I would be right back, and that the ambulance would be here in just a few moments and to hold on. I went back into the living room to check on Dan, and he was still sitting in the chair, crying his eyes out. I was obviously concerned because of the situation, but I figured it was best to try to talk to him, and to try to explain to the medics and police when they got there that Dan had some issues. I talked to him for a few moments, but wasn't able to get much information out of him about what happened, and then the medics came to check on the situation. I spoke to the police when they showed up, and told them that Dan had schizophrenia, and that he said he heard her, but didn't know what had really happened. They took over from there, and I went back over to my apartment. I didn't sleep that night, to be honest. A couple weeks later, I learned what really happened, and it wasn't what I anticipated. Dan had actually not hurt her. She had slipped in the shower. Dan had not actually hurt her. She had slipped in the shower, and Dan heard her fall. He went into the room and saw her on the floor, and had apparently panicked. He knew he needed to call for help, but his mind basically told him that he needed to panic. He really wanted to do what he was supposed to, but his brain was not able to process that he needed to call 911. But it got worse when he started telling himself that he had done it. My guess is he left the apartment to get someone else, but may have immediately forgotten what he set out to do. So he was just staring at the door trying to remember. And then I got home and that's where things went from there. I actually learned all of this from her when she came home and introduced herself. She didn't live there. She was just staying for a few days here and there to make sure he was okay because he was having issues with his medication. She told me that the only thing she remembered was slipping and then me standing over her telling her help was on the way. I was thankful that Dan hadn't actually hurt her, but it was obvious that he needed more help than what he was getting. He actually did get back on track with his meds, and the next time I saw him, he hugged me and thanked me for helping him. I told him it wasn't that big a deal, but he was adamant I had pretty much saved her life, and that me talking to him the way I had was what likely got him back to reality. I lived there for a few years after that with my roommate, but we ended up moving out around 2010. Dan lived there with his girlfriend the whole time, and he never had another major episode like that day. After that, he was the friendliest neighbor I ever had, and would always greet us with a bright smile. So, Dan, wherever you are out there, I hope you're doing well, and I would love it if we met again someday. I have only talked to about three people about this incident, largely because I feel as if it is my fault somehow. In 2018, I was hanging out with a friend that I wasn't supposed to be with. So, for the sake of secrecy and ease, I told my 17-year-old sister to drop me off at our old elementary school and then have them pick me up from there. Nothing weird happened. We hung out, and then I told them to drop me back off at the elementary school at midnight, the time of their curfew, and my sister would come get me. I was almost 15 at the time, and though we had moved about a 15-minute drive from our old school, it wasn't in a bad area. I used to live in Utah, specifically the Sandy area, in a middle-class neighborhood, though we weren't middle-class. It was a quiet neighborhood, full of Mormons, and I never truly had any scarring experiences. It is important to note that, despite being nearly 15, I probably looked anywhere between 9 and 12, as I was on the shorter side and I truly didn't hit puberty until about 15 and a half. When we pulled up to the school, there was a hatchback white car that was driving around rather recklessly such as speeding it around in reverse, doing spin-outs, and stuff like that. It was driving in circles around this curb that split off the drop-off zone 
in the small faculty parking lot. I sat with my friend in their car for a second, expressing my concerns about the other car, and they assured me that it was just some stupid teenager. I didn't say much more about it and said my goodbyes and got out of the car. The way the school is set up is that there is a large brick building, and when looking head-on at the school, there is a small opening to the left that leads back towards the playgrounds. The faculty parking lot is about 20 to 30 feet from the entrance to the school. When I got out of the car, I sat by the main office doors that would lead into the school right underneath a bright light. I needed to put my shoes on. I don't remember now why I hadn't done it before. The car stopped in the faculty parking lot, not in a parking spot, but in the middle of the central lane. Cautiously, I got up after successfully securing my shoes on my feet, and I stared at the car. As I said earlier, I am easily anxious. A man, hard to describe as he was backlit by a streetlight, got out and started walking towards his now open trunk. I watched as he paused and pulled something out of his trunk and then paused. Though I couldn't really see his face, I knew he was staring at me, and he said, I'm sorry for whatever happens to you. It's not your fault. I didn't say anything in return, and I ran towards the back of the school, and I kept running until I hit a large portable, hiding behind it and peering around towards the drop-off area. He must have gotten back in his car as he pulled out of the parking lot. The back area of the school is large, and in the far corner, there's a back exit onto a large, steep road that goes down. I tried to call my sister a few times, but after she didn't answer, I called my friend. I made my way towards the back alleyway and exited back onto the road, and just then as I crossed a small side street, the car turned onto the road. He saw me probably as immediately as I saw him, and I ran down the road hanging up on my friend. When I reached the bottom of the hill, there was a house in the corner, and I cut through their grass and stood on their stoop and rang their doorbell once. The car stopped at the corner, still on the street with the large hill. He then rolled down the window to talk to me. Hey, I'm a police officer. I wanted to know if you needed any help the man said, leaning slightly into the center console, presumptuously so I could hear him better. I insisted that I did not need help and that I was okay, but the man kept insisting that I come to the car. Of course I didn't. After about 30 seconds, he left. The people in the house opened their door and I was crying. It was a middle-aged man and his wife. They also had a dog, it seemed. I explained the situation about the car that was chasing me, and I got my friend who dropped me off on the phone. My friend is absolutely the worst at directions, and as the wife tried desperately to give it to them, it didn't seem to be getting anywhere. The car came back as the two were sitting on the stairs with me. I started freaking out as it drove slowly by the house, and all I could say was, That's them. That's the car. The man walked down his drive with the dog, but the car sped away. Eventually, my friend found their way, and the woman walked me up the hill to their car. I couldn't thank them enough. I went home and notified the police, but nothing ever came of it. I don't know what that man's intentions were, but I can clearly tell that they were not positive. So this was this week's collection of creepy Reddit stories featuring, again, Lady Spookaria and Miss Creepy Tales. Both ladies are great friends of mine. Absolutely adore these two. They're such just amazing people, in my opinion, and really do deserve a lot. So if you all enjoyed them, please do go down below to the description and click the link for their channels and send them some love. Sub, watch their videos. They're both... Um, they both post pretty frequently, pretty regularly at least. Um, they both stream on the weekends, I believe, on the weekends. They both stream regularly too, but anyway. 
both are great people and both are very, very deserving of all the love in the world. So please consider doing so. And also, if you enjoyed the video, please do consider also hitting that thumbs up button and subscribing to my channel if you're new. And yeah, if you're new, just know this is the last guest spot for a very long time. Probably next June. I may start doing these in June. I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. But I don't think I'll do one again the rest of the year. It's just been... It's been a fun month, but I think... I think I'm good on collabs, so... Yeah. All that said, friends... Um, and also, sorry, do leave me a comment to let me know your thoughts. Uh, uh, constructive criticism allowed, welcome, accepted, but constructive, please. And, yeah. I don't really have much else to say. Other than, I don't know, I guess just... Know that you all are loved, that you are important, and that every single one of you is valid. Nobody out there can, can take that from you, that you are valid and important. And no one ever should tell you otherwise, and don't let them. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Because again, you're the best you that you can be. You may be in a low point right now, but tomorrow, the birds will sing. So, yeah. Anyways, much love, friends. I'll see you on the next one. But until then, sleep well.